we are already in war and I would even claim that 24th of February uh, of 22 is actually 1st of September of 39. Hello and welcome to Offscript. My name is Stephen Edgington. With Russia's invasion of Ukraine, are we on the brink of a third world war? To discuss Vladimir Putin's goals, nuclear weapons and more, I'm joined by the Russian-American historian Dr. Yuri Felshtinsky, who has just published a new book called Blowing Up Ukraine. If Putin is able to invade and hold large portions of eastern and southern Ukraine, will he stop there? No. And I think we know this uh, from Mr. Putin uh, himself. When he invaded Crimea in 2014, and this was a very, uh, you know, quick and quote-unquote peaceful invasion. Not too many people were killed. Literally one person was killed. And uh, the rest of the world was puzzled. But generally what we heard from different corners of, of different countries uh, that uh, just tell us that this is the end of your geopolitical ambitions and we will forget it and, you know, it will start as if nothing happened. Uh, instead, Putin gave his uh, major speech on foreign policy, declaring that Russia is starting to correct historical mistakes uh, of 1991, and uh, Russia will start basically to build an empire, to rebuild an empire, which was lost in 1991. So, from, from the moment when Crimea was invaded, it was clear that this is just the beginning of a major, uh, you know, geopolitical correction, quote-unquote, which uh, the Russian government uh, plans to do. And we've seen it, of course, then uh, in the spring of the same year, 2014, with the invasion of eastern Ukraine. Then, uh, as we know, the conflict was kind of frozen for almost uh, eight years. But, uh, but political ambitions uh, was the same, and it was declared since 2014 many, many, many times uh, that Russia is uh, unhappy with the borders created in 1991 that uh, Russia doesn't recognize the borders which were created by the collapse of the Soviet Union, that indeed uh, Russia wants the power and influence which the Soviet Union had over the Eastern Europe. And uh, with time, uh, political rhetoric became more and more and more aggressive, and we started to hear similar statements, not just from Putin, but also from people like Patrushev, from people like uh, Medvedev, who was uh, you know, Putin's uh, friend and prime minister and president at one point. So uh, it became clear that this is not uh, Putin alone who is planning to rebuild or build a new empire. This is a collective decision of the collective uh, Russian uh, government. Uh, so that's where we are now. And indeed, uh, recently, it, it was even said that Russia doesn't recognize the borders of 1918. So again, uh, my view is that this is still just the beginning. The way it was started in 2014 and extended in 2022 and that we are actually uh, in, in war. We are already in war. And I would even claim that 24th of February uh, of 22 is actually 1st of September of 39. And you've written a book, Blowing Up Ukraine, all about this topic, and in which you claim that this could be the first episode of the Third World War, as it were. Um, can I just ask, before we get on to that, some commentators say that Putin isn't a sort of chess player. He hasn't been looking at this grand strategy over 20 years, that he simply reacts to events and exploits events when they are useful for him. 
Do you disagree with him? Do you, or do you disagree with that assessment? Do you think that Putin has been thinking about these issues for a long time and that this is part of some sort of grand master strategy um, to create his new Russian empire? Well, uh, I would say that it's much more complicated. Uh, I see Putin as a person who became president of Russia in 2000 on behalf of state securities. Uh, the, the structure which was known as KGB for many years, which is uh, now the, the FSB. But indeed, this is a structure which was created and formed in December of 1917. This is the oldest structure which, and the only one which survived the collapse of the Soviet Union. And, uh, you know, it was reformed with years, it was changed many times, but, but indeed this is the same structure which was created, believe it or not, in December of 1917. And from December of 1917, it had a major uh, goal the, 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 to take the world. And uh, the, the way it develops from 1918 or 1917, December of 1917 and 1991, this was a constant struggle between the state securities and the, KG, and the Communist Party. And the Communist Party, of course, existed, you know, for many years, and this was a political structure which had political control over uh, the KGB. And, uh, of course, this was communist control, but nevertheless, this was a kind of control, right? KGB was never an independent organization. Uh, and in 91, when the Soviet Union collapsed, and when, when communist monopoly for power, of course, collapsed in the Soviet Union, the KGB, for the first time in history, uh, got rid of this political control which they had since uh, 1917. And in 2000, they took control of the state. And this is very important to understand that since 2000, uh, we uh, had a situation when the state security was in charge of the major state, and not just a major state, but a major nuclear power. This never happened before. This, uh, people were never trained to build or to create. These people were trained to kill and to destroy. Uh, this is a machine which, again, existed, and by now it exists for more than 100 years, precisely for this goal to destroy and to kill. And that's what they're doing. That's why we see this level of destruction, for example, in, in Ukraine. Because for them, it's very natural. This is in their blood. We also face in a situation for the first time in, in history when state security controls the army. Again, this never happened before. This would be a government, a dictator, a monarch but not state security. So that's why we see Russian troops, you know, killing and, and raping and destroying everything they see. Uh, because these are not regular troops. These are actually, you know, kind of SS uh, German troops, you know, which, which are trained to, to kill and destroy. They're not trained to, to liberate or to, to be a peace, peacekeeping force, uh, or even just to take a territory. It's, this is not what they're doing. They're taking territory in order to destroy it completely. And that's why, why once again, we see this level of destruction in, in Ukraine. They probably do not have the army to take control of the, the entire country. But what they do is they concentrate to destroy a particular area or particular district, are destroyed, uh, pull out, regroup, and move to destroy the next district. And uh, and of course, Ukrainians are fighting and they're very good in what they're doing. But you see, after four months, uh, which is a long time actually, 
uh, we see a level of destruction very you know, dr dramatic. And if, if Russia is allowed to destroy Ukraine with the same speed, you know, after four more months, they would destroy similar amount of territories. And then after eight more months, they will destroy much more. So Ukraine is actually in a very difficult position. It's true that Russia is losing a lot of uh, people there and soldiers there, but uh, honestly, they, they do not really care. And indeed, uh, more people are killed, the, the more important the war becomes. And, and if you look at the history of the Second World War, for example, then one of the uh, arguments of the Soviet government always was that uh, Russia was the main player during the Second World War because the Soviet Union lost more people than any other country. So this became an argument claiming that uh, Russia was a major player of the coalition. What, what is questionable, uh, taking into account that uh, you know Soviet Union was getting a, a lot of help from from the uh, Western uh, countries, but but uh, the argument that Russia lost more Soviet Union, lost more people than any other country, became uh, you know the foundation for this uh, legend or claim or history books written in the Soviet Union that it was the Soviet Union who won the war. So the, 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 so the fact, once again, that Russia now is uh, losing uh, dozens of thousands of soldiers uh, would not be the reason to, to stop the war. That's, that's uh, any normal government probably would come to a conclusion that, well, since we are losing too many people, we probably should reconsider the, the, the military uh, policy or activity or stop the war altogether, but this is not going to happen to, in case of uh, Putin because, because again, the, the state security is in control and they, they see those things uh, differently. Now, you make many comparisons between the SS, the Nazis, 1939, and contemporary Russia, Vladimir Putin, and you talk about the state security services wanting to kill and destroy. Now, I would put it to you as a sort of counter-argument that maybe you're being too simplistic here. That killing and destroying is a means, it's not an end, it's not a sort of objective, it's a, sort of, it's a, it's a way of achieving an objective. So you could say that these people are willing to use these terrible tactics, but they don't just do it for the fun of it, presumably, unless you really are just saying these people are pure evil. They must have some kind of goal at the end of it. And another counterpoint I would say is that for the last 20 years, Russia hasn't been a North Korean-style dictatorship. It hasn't been like Nazi Germany even. It's been obviously authoritarian and anti-democratic, but the opposition hasn't generally been completely wiped out. There has still been some elements of democracy, some elements of opposition, and you can look to cases of assassinations and things like this, and you justifiably would do so. But, but the picture you're painting is of a group of people who are of purely evil, and don't you think that's just slightly too simplistic as an explanation as to what's going on in Russia at the moment? Well, I do not think this is uh, too simplistic. Uh, you see, uh, first of all, uh, Russia is moving towards a, a classical fascist state uh, very, very quickly. We, we could say the same about Germany, by the way. Hitler came to power in 32, and by 39, as we know, uh, Germany was ready to, to begin the Second World War, uh, and it took them only seven years. Putin came to power in 2000. Uh, not just he came to power in 2000, he became president in 2000, by, but by 2000, the major positions within the state, within the Russian state, were already taken by the uh, FSB. It's, uh, it was not seen this way, and uh, people always would say that, well, we have market economy, we will buy all those people, we have more money than they do, so we are not afraid actually of FSB officers taking government positions or, uh, you know, positions within 
private companies because we, we always will, will find common language with them. They are people who are interested in being rich, they are interested in traveling abroad, etc., etc. And uh, this, as we see, started to change very rapidly um, when Putin became uh, president and we, when he started to promote to major government and uh, political positions openly uh, former officers of KGB. And, uh, you know, very quickly we realized that the state is controlled indeed by officers of KGB, but by, by those people who were working all their life for, for the KGB. Now, uh, we could say that at one point Russia became, uh, you know, very close to something like uh, fascist Italy. You know, we stayed with open borders, with market economy, with people smiling, with people traveling. But nevertheless, this was a kind of, well, fascist state when the government uh, was cruel and was in control of everything, when the government started to take freedom of press uh, slowly, you know, under its control when elections were stolen from people on both central and local levels. And and uh, then, uh, you know, I would say everything changed after 24th of February. Russia, uh, prior to 24th of February and after 24th of February, is a completely different state. And this happened literally, you know, overnight. And, uh, and uh, I have to say that everybody was surprised how quickly this happened overnight. And uh, now I think it's fair to say that we are dealing with a structure which is very similar to Nazi Germany, uh, you know, in, in, in 39. Now, the, the uh, you know, chief, chief of staff or his British position, I think, uh, is named differently. Uh, Sanders uh, said recently that he think he thinks that we are in 1937 now. Uh, this is possible, you know. I'm claiming that I would say we are now in you know, the end of 1939. But uh, but it's possible that we are now in 1937, what gives us two more years before uh, a full-scale uh, Third World War. And uh, you mentioned the goal, I mean, the goal of the destruction. I mean, what would be the reason for them to just destroy entirely a territory which they take? By the way, uh, you know, the way geography works uh, with Ukraine, the territories which they invaded are uh, Russian language territories where ethical Russians lived. I mean, they lived there for generations and for many, many, many years, but these are Russians mainly who speak Russian. And so they're destroying their cities so far. Kharkov is a Russian city. It always was. Uh, it was a quote unquote Russian capital of Ukraine. Mariupol, which they destroyed completely, was the most pro Russian city in Ukraine. When, when 2000, uh, in, in uh, 2014 invasion, uh, when it happened, Mariupol actually had you know, pro Russian uh, demonstrators on the streets demanding uh, separation from Ukraine. So uh, they're destroying uh, the most Russian parts of Ukraine now. They do not care. And I will, uh, I think I know why. Because this is not about Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine just an example. Ukraine just the first country which they invaded. Uh, what they're trying to show, to demonstrate to the entire world that, look, guys, you have a choice uh, to surrender or we will destroy you the way we destroy Ukraine. Have you seen what we've done in Ukraine? We are going to do the same with Moldova. Is If Moldova chooses to be independent, we will do the same with the Baltic states. We will do the same with any country which we invade unless 
you surrender. And uh, if you listen what Putin was saying many times in front of different audiences, uh, his complaint was that the West does not hear us. We, we say something. I mean, we, we talk to you. You do not hear us. Well, maybe now you will hear us. We, we invaded Ukraine. We destroy Ukraine because we would like to become an empire again. Do you hear us now? No? All right, we will invade Moldova. Will you hear us now? Well, then we will try with the Baltic states. Or we will try with the transfer uh, of nuclear weapons to Belarus with the readiness to fire from Belarus if you do not give us what we want. The problem is that what we, what we want, what they want, is actually everything. And th this is the major problem, because indeed this is not about the Ukraine, this is not about Moldova, this is not about Belarus, and this is not even about the Baltic state. This is about the control of the world. And in the speeches which again were given recently, and once again they are becoming more and more aggressive with every day, uh, because there are no limits now, and there is no control, and there is no shame, and all masses are taken down, and you could speak you know, openly and say what you want. Uh, they, they do want the entire world. They actually see it as a competition not only with the West, meaning a former Western Europe, but with the United States as well. And, uh, you know, they're demanding more territories, uh, what sometimes, uh, you know, seems to be uh, naive or too primitive, but, but indeed, uh, if they do not recognize the borders of 1918, what was said, Finland, of course, uh, belonged to, to the Russian Empire uh, before 1918. So this were not just the Baltic states, this were not just Poland, uh, at least partially, but also Finland. And then, uh, believe it or not, and we could smile now about this, but Alaska once uh, belonged to, to the Russian Empire as well and was sold to the United States uh, by the Russian government. So, uh, indeed, if you look around the Russian Federation, which is a huge country, I mean, if you look at the map, it's a huge country, and you might be puzzled that this huge country is crying that it does not have enough territories. Uh, and, and that's what you read uh, in Russian newspapers or hear from Russian leaders, um, as well as from propagandistic channels, that Russia just cannot survive without Ukraine, <clears throat> that there is no Russia without Ukraine. Russia cannot survive without being empire. And we are talking about a country <clears throat> where probably 90% of lands are not developed at all. I mean, if you if you look in, in the direction of Vladivostok, then the, the the entire territory is actually empty. It's, uh, there are, there are, there are, people do not live there. It's not developed at all. So uh, this is not, of course, about territory. Also, the claim is that Russia needs more territory. This about this is about the destruction of different civilizations which exist, because Russia cannot, unfortunately, coexist with them, right? Because uh, the, Russia does not feel itself great when other countries like Poland or the Baltic states uh, exist as independent, when uh, other countries like Britain or the United States to, to claim that Russia is not, you know, developed enough to, to consider it to be a great nation and the only reason people, you know, deal with it as a great nation because it has nuclear weapons and oil and gas. So that's why Russia is trying, instead of rebuilding itself, find it's much quicker and easier to destroy other kind of civilizations which which exist. 
Uh, so it's 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 partially philosophical, it's it's partially historical because Russia always existed as an empire. It was empire prior to 1918. It was empire prior to 1991. Different kind of empires, but this were empires. And uh, Russians, unfortunately, lost the empire in 91. But still, uh, the unfortunate part is that they still believe that they are, you know, they have to be an empire. And, and to be an empire, they need to be in control of, of other nations. And they do not have this control. And they're not ready to realize that the 1918 is gone a long time ago. And actually, 1991 is gone a long time ago. And the world is different. So they're returning us to the old kind of world when, when empires existed. And that's the major problem. Let's get really specific. I just so that I, I'm making sure that I'm understanding you correctly. Now you talk about world domination, that being the goal of of the Russian elite. Can you get specific? Where exactly has Putin, where exactly have Russian leaders and politicians talked about invading other countries or taking over the world? Specific on that one, you know, just so that I'm understanding you correctly, that is what you're saying. And secondly, right. uh, Ukraine. U Ukraine's quite a specific example because, as you m rightly mentioned, there are many Russian speakers in Ukraine. Russia and Ukraine's history have been interlinked. Ukraine has only been a country since 1991. So this is how Putin justifies his invasion of Ukraine because there are historic links between the two countries. So then you talk about the Baltic states and you talk about Alaska and you talk about Moldova. There are, those countries are different, aren't they, to Ukraine because they don't have that similar history, that shared history that Ukraine and Russia has. So I just want to be a bit more nuanced here and just focus on those individual countries and also on this idea, which I, I personally, I've never heard of Putin or anyone saying that they want to dominate the world. But maybe you can give me some examples of where, of where they've said that, if that is what you're claiming. Well, uh, the, the first speech uh, which uh, Putin gave uh, in relation to foreign policy uh, was uh, 2007 in Munich. And basically it became clear from that speech that Russia is not happy with the borders of 1991. Uh, and uh, then of course uh, after, soon after Russia invaded Georgia. And uh, this was a complicated invasion for, for the world because, you know, Georgia is a small country, it's difficult to find out the map, it's specifically difficult to find out what's going on within Georgia, between Abkhazia, South Ossetia, and Georgia, and Russia at the same time had uh, North Ossetia Republic. So, this was so complicated for the world that the world decided just, you know, do not, do not pay any attention to this. And uh, then, of course, uh, Crimea happened. And when Crimea happened, uh, everybody, I mean, literally everybody, all foreign leaders, basically told Putin, look, just tell us that this is the end of your uh, you know, foreign policy or geopolitical ambitions, and we will close our eyes. And instead, Putin gave his major speech that Russia is starting to correct historical mistakes uh, which were created uh, by the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991. And Russia is starting to reconsider the, the borders which were created in 1991. And that's how it uh, was, meaning this speech was repeated many, many, many times in different forms in front of different audiences that Russia is starting to correct historical mistakes. As at the same time, Putin was saying that the collapse of the Soviet Union was a major personal tragedy for him and major geopolitical catastrophe for the Russian Federation. I mean, this, this became, became a, a slogan, right? Uh, now, if you if you listen current speeches and the, the last one 
I heard uh, was uh, in in Russian, uh, in front of a Russian audience through TV. Uh, then Putin was saying that this conflict is not with the Ukraine. And this conflict is not even with Europe. This conflict is between Russia and the United States. Uh, if you read uh, an interview uh, which uh, Patrushev, uh, Nikolai Patrushev, uh, who is former FSB director and uh, now he is in charge of the uh, Council of uh, State Security of Russia, and many people consider him like number two in the Russian Federation. Well, he may be number three or maybe number five, but he de is definitely one of those five people who are in charge of everything. Um, uh, then uh, he actually was saying that uh, the entire world is fighting against Russia and Russia is retaliating against this entire world. And uh, Russia is going to use different kind of weapons and not just, you know, weapon the way we know it, but uh, Russia is going to create artificial hunger in Africa through destruction of Ukrainian grain and force millions of migrants from Africa uh, to take cover from hunger in Europe and uh, what would destroy Europe. So basically he was saying that we will destroy Europe through the creation of uh, crisis of uh, migrants, right? The hunger crisis. So uh, Russia is fighting a major war against the entire world. What I think by now is recognized by NATO as a you know, structure, as an institution. And if you read the statements which were coming from Madrid, uh, you know, where, where a summit of uh, NATO leaders uh, took place recently, they do understand this danger. They do understand it. They, they're talking about, you know, increasing the army, like from 40,000 40, to 300,000 in Europe, you know, quick, quick, uh, you know, reaction army. Um, uh, everybody is increasing military budgets. I mean, we might be in 1937, what might mean that we have uh, two more years, but it's very possible that we are already once again in 1939 and we may not have those two years because if they start to transfer nuclear weapons to Belarus, and I think that's what we are going to witness very soon, then uh, we are talking about uh, nuclear confrontation. And, and, and this, of course, change, changes everything because we really, we really do not know what nuclear war would look like. We really do not know what's going to happen. So it's, it's a completely different scenario. I'm still not quite convinced that they're aiming for world domination through your statements. It sounds like they're, they feel that they're being on the defensive against the world. That's not the quite the same thing as being offensive, if you see what I mean. But let's move on from that very briefly, just because World War Three. this is the topic of your book. You talk about nuclear annihilation, nuclear war. Uh, you're talking about 1939, the Third World War, that we could potentially be in. Do you think that the West should be more aggressive towards Russia and towards Putin? Do you think that we should engage in a, a war with Russia to stop them from using nuclear weapons or whatever? Do you think the West, basically what I'm asking is, do you think the West should be more aggressive in their stance towards Russia at the moment? Uh, well, first of all, I, uh, I have to, to correct you. The, 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 the fact that uh, the Russian government in claiming that we are defending ourselves doesn't really mean that they are uh, defending us, themselves. Doesn't really mean that they are not an aggressive country. Uh, well, Hitler was saying the same. Hitler was saying that Britain and France actually are aggressors. Indeed, Hitler was saying that this was France and Britain 
uh, who declared war against Germany, but not Germany. Germany never declared war against uh, France and uh, Britain. And technically speaking, this was correct. All Germany have done in September of 1931, uh, was uh, to to invade uh, Poland. Um, speaking about Russian population, which you also mentioned, you see again the the last time. Uh, Somebody was trying to, in Europe, to uh, unite everybody who was uh, speaking the same language was, of course, Hitler uh, and Germany in, in 1930s. And prior to 1939, he successfully united all Germans speaking German uh, in Europe in the borders of uh, one state. And the entire world kind of accepted this, right? Uh, they didn't accept the fact that Germany invaded Poland. But prior to this, all invasions which uh, you know Hitler uh, made were, were basically allowed to, to, to proceed, right? Uh, Russia, except of German invasion of Russia, uh, of June 22, 1941, uh, Soviet Union was never invaded and Russia was never invaded. So uh, you could hear Russian leaders talking about the world, uh, you know, hating Russia, or fighting against Russia, but uh, you know, for practical purposes, it, this was the Soviet Union in, and Russia uh, which would invade a territory every time. And there are many, of course, examples uh, with, you know, with Soviet history and during Stalin's period, right? You know, Soviet Union invaded Finland, Soviet Union invaded the Baltic States, Soviet Union invaded uh, Romania, Romania, Soviet Union invaded Poland. Uh, indeed, there is no country around the Soviet Union which didn't lose uh, at least small territory to, to the Soviet Union. And once again, Soviet Union was a huge country. It was not like starving without extra land. Uh, so Russia always was aggressive. Uh, the West uh, never invaded Russia. This just never happened. Uh, so all this... Uh, you know, claims that Russia is afraid of NATO or is afraid of the United States. They might be afraid of them, but but there is no reason uh, for them to be afraid. They was never invaded. They're afraid of Napoleon. Well, once again, uh, correct, correct, correct. But this was some time ago, let's say, well, you know, well, it was different those, those centuries. And yes, uh, should the West be more aggressive? This is a very important uh, question. And we know that every time Russia invades, like in 2008, like in 2014, uh, like it's happening now, uh, the West is trying to appease. It's not because the West is weak. Uh, it's not because the West does not know what it's doing. Uh, it knows perfectly well what it's doing. It's trying to avoid the war, or it's trying to limit the war. And it's always hoping that the war will die within certain borders and will never spread to the West, right? And uh, what is cynical and you know, probably, probably the, we might criticize the West for this. And if we take the example of Ukraine, we see now that, uh, let's put it this way, if, if NATO would intervene in, in Ukraine, the war would be over in two weeks. I mean, we know this by now because we, we see that the Russian army from military point of view is not actually doing great at all. And if even Ukrainians are able to hold it, 
And by the way, it's true that Ukrainians are getting financial support and military support from the West. But from Ukrainian point of view, uh, and they're trying to be diplomatic and very nice to the West because without this help, Ukraine would be like gone. So this help is very critical. But they're getting like 10 times more, uh, less than they need. Literally, they, they are getting like 10% of the military equipment which they, they need to, to fight this war against uh, Russia. They are outnumbered in terms of people, they are outnumbered numbered in terms of military equipment. Russia, by the way, was uh, the second producer of weapons in the world after the United States. So Russia is a major military power where the military production is actually, a, a, you know, a major component of the state's economy and taking into account that this is a country with 100 million dollar people population and taking into account that they do not really care how many people are killed because, you know, historical life is very cheap in Russia. Uh, you know, they're in a much better position than, than Ukrainians. So the only the only reason Ukraine still exists because Ukrainians are literally ready to die for their freedom and they're not ready to surrender. They will not surrender, but they will be destroyed. And that's, that's where the problem is. Now, once again, in the West, everybody hopes that this conflict will, you know, will die within Ukrainian borders. The problem is that this is uh, this might be a very naive uh, approach and a very naive look at the situation because once again I do not believe that for Putin this is about Ukraine or for the Russian government I have to say this is about Ukraine. Uh, I do not think this is about Ukraine. I do not think this is about Belarus, which they already took. And I do not believe this is about uh, Moldova, which uh, definitely will be the next in line as soon as the Russian army uh, reaches uh, Transnistria, which is a Russian-speaking area within Moldova, where 120, approximately 120 Russian citizens live. As, by the way, Dmitry Medvedev stated like several days ago, by now, probably a week ago, he stated that they have information that Romania uh, is planning to uh, invade Moldova and that they have 220,000 Russian citizens living in Moldova. Now, there is a major correction to this. They have 220,000 Russian speaking citizens in Moldova because for many, many, many years, Actively, especially actively after 2014, Russia started to issue uh, Russian passports to citizens of Moldova who live in those Russian-speaking territories where Russia already has its army. So uh, Russia actually has military presence in Moldova. And in those areas, they issue Russian uh, passports uh, in order to claim that they invaded Moldova to save Russian citizens from, you know, genocide. And so it's it's a long-term policy. You know, in case of Moldova, again, this, the, the troops were there since the collapse of the Soviet Union, by the way, the Russian troops were staying in Moldova. And uh, the passports they started to, to give actively since 2014, uh, that's, that's when they, they actually started to prepare the invasion of Moldova, right? But then we have an issue, but these countries are not members of NATO, fine. And as Biden stated, what I think was a major mistake, and I think it was recognized, by American administration as a major mistake, uh, that we will defend every inch of NATO territory. Uh, when he was saying this, he of course forgot that Finland and Sweden are not members of NATO, but this is now corrected by the fact that both Finland and Sweden are you know, becoming uh, members of the NATO alliance. 
Uh, but anyway, uh, the, the major problem for uh, Russia then after Moldova, after Ukraine, after Belarus uh, would be the Baltic states. And uh, not only because the Baltic states belong to, to the Russian Empire and Soviet Empire, but uh, not only because there are a lot of Russians, by the way, living in the Baltic states. Now, Russians are living in the Baltic states because when the Soviet Union invaded in 1940, they, of course, started to switch populations. They sent, uh, you know, uh, Lithuanians and Estonians and Latvians to Siberia to concentration camps. And, uh, you know, the Russian army with their families settled in the Baltic states. So mainly the, the Russian population, which is there, these are, you know, relatives and children of those Russian officers, Soviet officers who are living in the Baltic states. But this is fine, it's history, this happens, there are a lot of Russians there, and this creates a reason for the Russian government to claim that they have to defend those Russians who live in the Baltic states. Now, and who are second-class citizens, blah, blah, blah. Well, of course, this is precisely the argument which Hitler was using in the 1930s, and believe it or not, but uh, Putin is going to repeat it with the Baltic states. Now, the problem is that the Baltic states are mainly of NATO. And that's where nuclear weapons come uh, as a great help. And if, if you imagine a situation when nuclear weapons is already in Belarus, then basically you are risking an ultimatum. Uh, which you will get from Putin to dissolve NATO or to expel all countries which joined NATO after 1991 uh, in order to prevent a nuclear strike which the Russian government would conduct from Belarus. So, your question about with the, the NATO alliance being more aggressive uh, should be considered uh, in connection with this particular danger. A danger of nuclear strike from Belarus against uh, members of NATO, uh, first of all, uh, Poland and the Baltic states. And uh, I think that's what we are going to face. You wrote a book in 2002 with Alexander Litvinenko blowing up Russia. Now, for those who don't know, Litvinenko was a Russian spy who was poisoned in 2006 and killed by, by Putin, basically, by Russian agents. Are you concerned or, about your own safety uh, since writing your books? I mean, do you, you're in America at the moment. Can you just give, up, give us a bit of background about your sort of personal interactions with Russia, etc.? Well, uh, this was never an issue, my personal safety. You know, all, all I do, I write, right? I, I mean, I'm not able to, to do anything else, right? I, mean, I just write books. Uh, it's true that uh, the, the uh, blowing up Russia uh, became a very... Uh, special book and unfortunately it led to to several people being killed uh, starting uh, with, uh, with Litvinenko but he was not the the only one but but you see now to uh, the, the issue of personal uh, security now when we are discussing the uh, possibility of full-scale nuclear war becomes irrelevant, trust me. And, and uh, but, but I, I have to say that, uh, that I, I have family, I have children, and yes, I, I think that it would be uh, very uh, nice for us to prevent nuclear war. Otherwise, uh, we just will kill uh, everybody, right? But, but in order to prevent nuclear war, yes, we have to probably to act preventively. 
uh, I was saying once, this was before 19, uh, 2022, before the invasion of Ukraine, I was saying once that in order to prevent the uh, invasion of the Russian army, Ukrainians uh, have to start, uh, you know, act and think as Israelis. Because you see, uh, you, you, need, you need sometimes to start preventive wars to survive, especially if your enemy is stronger. If your enemy is weaker, you do not need to strike preventively. Uh, that's what the, the Russian uh, state is doing usually, because the enemy is weaker, so they just invade, right? But, uh, but in terms of uh, fighting a possibility of nuclear war being conducted from Belarus, uh, or let's say from Donbass, which is occupied by the Russian army and which is technically Ukrainian territory, and you could move very easily tactical nuclear weapons to Donbass, which is Ukraine, uh, you, you, you have to uh, strike preventively. I think there is. uh, I think there are a lot of military leaders uh, of NATO who would agree with you, and I I sincerely hope that that's what's going to happen if we see the movement of nuclear weapons to to Belarus. I think we would have no choice. Thank you so much for joining us. That was an absolutely terrifying interview. Uh, I mean, but, but very interesting. And I Thank hope you. to be wrong. I, I mean, I do not know how many, many times I have to stress this. I, that I sincerely hope to be wrong. Uh, I'm just afraid that I might be right.